So you, you mentioned naturalism a few minutes ago, also in connection with Hume. And philosophical naturalism hasn't come up on the show for a very long time. So what is philosophical naturalism? And what do you mean when you write, it, as you wrote in your paper, Nietzsche's naturalistic moral anti-psychology, uh, that his naturalism is methodological? So philosophers mean a lot of different things by naturalism. I'm going to focus on a characterization that I think is helpful for reading Nietzsche, but also applies to certain other philosophical naturalists. Um, so the, the central idea of philosophical naturalism is that there's a kind of continuity between philosophy and the empirical sciences, especially. You know? um, in, uh, in a more ambitious form, it is the claim uh, which, uh, you know, which is often associated with uh, the American, 20th century American philosopher Quine, um, that philosophy has no distinctive method of its own. There's no distinctive philosophical way of producing truths about the world. Philosophy in, the, in Quine's view, it's kind of the abstract reflective branch of empirical science. Right? Um, something like that is Nietzsche's view um, with a couple, of, a couple of caveats, right? One is Nietzsche thinks um, that, uh, Nietzsche thinks that genuine philosophers, as he calls them, right, do something very distinctive, which is they create values. They create new ways of valuing things. Um, whereas philosophers like Kant or Hegel, he calls them great philosophical laborers. All they do, as he puts it, is press into formulas existing moral valuations. Okay? Nietzsche certainly doesn't want to be that kind of philosophical laborer. Right? And I think Nietzsche does think of himself as someone who creates values. Right? But I take it Nietzsche thinks of his main critical task right, is getting us into a position where we can actually create new values by realizing that the, mor the moralities we have inherited Right. Admit of naturalistic explanation. We can give historical explanation of how this morality arose and see that it's just one kind of morality, right? That it is not the only way of thinking about questions, questions of value. So Nietzsche also has a much broader conception of science, say, than someone like Quine, though very late in his life, Quine loosens up. But uh, for much of his career, Quine has a very austere view of which sciences count. Nietzsche, you know, in, in German, the, the word for science is Wissenschaft. Wissenschaft in German does not mean natural science. It means any rigorous methodology that can be applied to a subject matter and, uh, you know, and give us knowledge of truths about that subject matter. So history is a Wissenschaft. Classics as Nietzsche thinks of it, is a Wissenschaft or a science. Okay? Um, and, but Nietzsche also, and this is important to understand about Nietzsche, and I think a lot of people often don't know this about him, is that Nietzsche became, starting in the 1860s when he first read Friedrich Wagner's History of Materialism, becomes very interested in contemporary German physiology and the life sciences, and eventually also in, in Darwin. Um, and you know he begins extensive reading um, of journals in the sciences, and he gets you know this handbook of physiology. And, and Germany, as you may know, it was the birthplace of modern physiology, starting in the 1840s and and afterwards. And so all of this makes a very very strong impression on Nietzsche, and he takes over this idea from these German materialists that you can give naturalistic explanations, that is explanations in terms of physiology, but also importantly for Nietzsche in terms of psychology, of why people believe what they believe and do what they do, right? Um, that you can also historicize people's moral beliefs. You can show where they came from. You can in particular, this is the subject of his famous genealogy of morality, you can show what psychological mechanisms motivate Right, the development of different parts of our our modern uh, modern morality. So Nietzsche is a naturalist in the sense that he wants to treat human beings like any other part of nature, and that he takes his cue for how to understand human beings from the sciences. 
Though importantly, Nietzsche, and this he has in common with David Hume, is also what I call a speculative naturalist, right? That is, um, you know, Hume is very impressed by Newtonian mechanics, but Newtonian mechanics uh, has nothing to say about human beings or human society. So Hume is going to speculate using sort of Newtonian mechanics as his model and try to give a causal and uh, naturalistic explanation of human beings, of human morality, of human societies, and, and, and so on. Nietzsche is also a kind of speculative naturalist that he reads in physiology, he reads in the life sciences, but then he, what doesn't exist at the time he's writing is a sophisticated form of human psychology. The main form of psychology at the time is introspection, and Nietzsche is a complete skeptic about introspection. Nietzsche, you know, anticipates a lot of ideas from Freud. One of them is that um, most of our mental life is unconscious, and we can't simply introspect that. Right? Um, we need a more sophisticated psychology in which we infer the actual drives or the actual motivations underlying human behavior, even though they may be completely opaque to the actors themselves, even though the actors themselves may be unaware of the genuine causes of their action. And so Nietzsche develops a very sort of elaborate speculative um, uh, psychology, um, you know, that has sort of two key elements to it. One is the notion of a drive, a kind of standing disposition um, to act in certain kinds of ways, to seek out certain kinds of affective or emotional uh, experiences, right? So the sex drive is a standing disposition to seek sexual arousal, right? for example. Um, drives operate unconsciously, right? But the other key part of his general picture of human psychology is that, um, you know, people have emotions or affects, and those they actually experience, though they may not realize where they're really coming from. That is what's, what's giving rise to them. Um, and so, you know, with this bare bones apparatus um, in which our unconscious life is primary, um, drives push and pull us in different directions, often unbeknownst to us. Um, and then we do experience affects and emotions, and they are much more powerful than reason, right? That they are, you know, and again, this is very like Hume, right? Um, reason is largely, you know, impotent in the face of, as Hume would put it, the passions, right? Reason is the slave of the passions. As Hume puts it, Nietzsche has actually a very similar, uh, similar kind of view, except he speaks not about passions, but about um, gefula emotions about affect and which is affects um, and roughly feelings and affects as we would say in English. Um, so that's the sense in which Nietzsche is a naturalist. Uh, it's going to explain in largely causal terms, um, you know, the psychological mechanisms in particular that gave rise to the Judeo-Christian morality we find ourselves with today. That, that in a capsule formulation is what his naturalism is about. But by the same token, he thinks that kind of naturalism is useful for the project of creating new values. Right? One way it's useful is that it sort of debunks the pretense of this morality to be bestowed upon us by God. Right? No, no, Nietzsche is going to tell you naturalistically how this morality triumphs, what kind of psychological mechanisms in human beings that exploit it in order to be so successful. Okay. Um, and second of all, the naturalistic explanation is going to show us that um, Christian morality is not the only kind of morality there is. Right? Um, and here Nietzsche, as you know, uh, with history um, and with you know, philology, etymology in particular, um, he's going to show that the words, the moral words we have used have been very different over time in different languages. And that the distinctions that we think of as central to morality, such as the difference between good actions and evil actions, um, were not distinctions drawn um, in ancient cultures and in ancient moralities. And we can talk more about that when we get back to the genealogy.